we're going to take a look at some essential functions that you will encounter often in calculus. And the first one here that we're going to take a look at, which you will see a lot, is called the linear function. So recall that equations of lines can be written in several forms. And the first form is called general form. And this is usually written as ax plus by plus c equals zero, where a, b, and c are real numbers. The next form is a slope y-intercept form. And this is written as y equals mx plus b. m is the slope. So that number tells us the slope. And the number b tells us the y-intercept. The last form is called the point-slope form. And this is written as y minus y1 equals m bracket x minus x1. Now the points x1 and y1 is a point on the line. Remember that when we have lines that are horizontal or vertical, they're actually special and for horizontal lines, they are written as usually y equals a number. So we'll call that y equals b, because that's where it hits the y-intercept. So graphically, we would have a horizontal line, and it would hit this point here at b. A vertical line hits the x-axis, so we would say that x is equal to, we'll call this a, and graphically, this would mean that we have this vertical line and we would hit the x-axis right at A. Now, let's go a little bit further. So to find the slope, uh, remember that slope, we can also call it M, and it equals rise divided by the run, which is the change in the Y divided by the change in the X. So I'm using the symbol delta to represent change. So if we have this line with these two endpoints, and let's say that this is P1, which is X1, Y1, and we have this other point P2, which is X2, Y2. If we create this triangle here, we would say this is the slope, which is rise divided by run. So to calculate the rise, we could say that this is going to equal the difference between the y values, so y2 minus y1. And to calculate the run, it would be the difference in the x values, which is x2 minus x1. Remember that horizontal lines have or has a slope of 0. And vertical lines, they don't have a slope, so it has no slope. But we call this to be an undefined, an undefined slope. So calculus, um, in the first part of the term, um, slope is really, really important in calculus. So we need to remember that slope can be interpreted in two ways. So it is a measure of the steepness of the line. But it could also mean the rate of change. Of y with respect to x. Recall that parallel lines have the same slope. But perpendicular lines, or in calculus, we often call them normal lines, they have negative reciprocal 
slopes. So that means, for example, if the slope is a half, the perpendicular slope, which is represented by this upside down t, would equal negative 2 over 1. So it has to be negative and the reciprocal. If you ever multiply these two slopes together, the original slope times the perpendicular slope will give you negative 1. So in class, what we're going to do is we're going to practice by writing equations of lines. And we won't do that here, but you can practice that in class. So polynomial functions. Um, a function p is called a polynomial if it looks something like this. I know this looks really complicated, um, but the n, if you look, the n are where the exponent is, but it also represents the subscript for the coefficient. So n, um, in a polynomial, it has to be a whole number. Um, and the numbers, we'll just call them uh, the coefficients a0, a1, a2, and so on. These are, remember, they're called coefficients. So the degree of a polynomial is the greatest exponent of x. So whichever one is the highest of, of the variable is the degree. Now, if the leading coefficient, um, a sub n, doesn't equal 0, then the degree of the polynomial is going to be whatever that first term, x exponent is. And the term whose value is not affected by the variable is the constant term. So if you look at the last term, a naught here, it doesn't have any x, so that's called the constant term. And the domain of any polynomial function is always going to be all real numbers. Okay. Let's take a look at some uh, more specific types of polynomials. So if n is even, so if the highest degree um, n is even, and the coefficient in the front of that first um, term is positive, then both ends of the graph will point up. So a really familiar graph that you were looked at last year is y equals x squared, which gave us the parabola. So you'll notice that both of those point up. But other expressions, such as y equals x to the power of 4 plus 7x minus 1, because the highest exponent is 4, this would also point, both ends would point up. Now, if it's even, but the coefficient is actually less than 0, then both ends of the graph are actually going to point down. So, for example, we can have y equals negative x squared. And this is the parabola, which points down. We can also have y equals negative 5x to the 6 minus 2. And this would also point down. Now, if n, the exponent, is odd and the coefficient is positive, then the left end will point down and the right end points up. So the most common example that you've probably seen is y equals x. So that's just a line that, notice the left end points down and the right end points up. And even in y equals x cubed, you can see that n points up and the right side points down. If n is odd, so you notice the exponent is odd, um, but the coefficient now is less than zero, the left end points up now, and the right end points down. So we can have y equals negative x, and this would have a line going down to the right. And when we have y equals negative x cubed, this would have the graph going 
also down to the right, but the left end would point up. Now generally, um, the number of bumps in the graph um, is based on the exponent, and it's always going to be one less than the degree. Next we have um, the power functions. So this is where we have f of x equals x to the power of a, where a is a constant. So if a is equal to n, where n is a positive integer, so x to the n, where it's 1, 2, 3, 4, and etc., then we have the ones that we were just kind of looking at before. So, for example, we have y equals x, which is a line, y equals x squared, we get the parabola, y equals x cubed, we have a cubic graph, y equals x to the 4, now this one's a special one, this actually creates, looks like a parabola, but it's a little bit more flat, and it's u-shaped. And this is just for x, um, where there's um, nothing else added on. When a is equal to 1 over n, so the exponent is rational, um, n is a positive integer, such as this, then you'll notice that you get graphs that look like this. For example, we know that y equals x to the half, which is actually the square root, of x. That gives us something that looks like this, kind of like a shooting star. If we have y equals x to the one third, which is the cube root of x, it kind of looks something like this. Lastly, um, if a is equal to negative 1, um, this is, gives us a reciprocal function because the exponent is negative, we're going to flip that um, base so that it actually becomes in the denominator. So we actually end up getting a rational. So when this happens, we're going to get two parts of the graph. So for y equals 1 over x, you get a graph actually that looks like this. So there's actually two pieces where the x and the y-axis acts as asymptotes. So our last type of function is the rational function. Um, the rational function f is a ra ratio of two polynomials, um, f of x, where p of x is divided by q of x, and p and q are polynomials. But remember that we can't have q equal to 0 because we can't divide by 0. So just very simply, an example of this would be that f of x is equal to 3x squared minus 5x plus 7, so that's a polynomial, and that can be divided by, let's say, x cubed plus 2, which is also a polynomial, but together this whole expression creates a rational function. Um, now in class we're going to take a look at how to create a new function from old functions.